James chapter 3, James chapter 3, and uh, look at verses 3 through 12, 3 through 12, and we'll just kind of summarize these verses as we go along in James chapter 3, verses 3 through 12. Before we start, would you bow in prayer with me, please? Father in heaven, we again thank you for your blessings. We thank you for your word. And Lord, now as we uh, teach and preach from this passage of Scripture, uh, Lord, uh, about the tongue, we know that all of us uh, from time to time may open our mouths when we shouldn't. And sometimes, Lord, we uh, don't open it when we should. And so, Lord, uh, uh, help us to uh, gather from what is written here uh, by James so that we can apply it uh, to our own lives. And Lord, just bless your word as it goes out, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You may have heard me uh, tell this uh, before, maybe once or twice, but there were uh, three preachers who had gathered together one night for me. Just some pastorly bonding and fellowship. And the first preacher made the suggestion. He said, uh, why don't we all, why don't we each just confess a problem that we struggle with? And the second preacher said, well, why not? It's just the three of us here. So the first preacher said, I must admit, I have a problem with gambling. Every weekend I'm tempted to hit the slot machines. Well, the second preacher said, it's my turn. He said, I have a problem with lust. I catch myself looking at several women at the church. And the third preacher said, well, I have a problem. He said, I like to gossip, but I can't wait to leave here tonight to tell everybody <laughs> what I've heard. <laughs> they might should have let him go first, maybe, shouldn't they? They may have changed what they decided to share. Someone has said, watch your tongue. It's in a wet place where it's easy to slip. Yes, the tongue is that one muscle in your body that receives the most exercise, it seems. And it's very hard to control. The tongue can be helpful. You know, as you were eating all that Thanksgiving food the last few days, it helped you to taste. The salt in some of the food, it helped you taste that sweet, whatever it was, some of those desserts that you had. So the tongue can be helpful in moving the food around and so forth. And, and it's helpful in closing the opening of our trachea. And it helps in making sounds, and that's where we tend to get in trouble. So let's have a healing spring survey this morning. I want you to raise your hand if you have ever at some point in your life opened your mouth and you probably should have just kept your mouth shut, shut and not said anything at all. I'm sure everybody in here has uh, done that at some point, said something you shouldn't have. Well, one measure of somebody raised their hands twice. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. One measure of spiritual maturity is a believer's spit. And so James devoted a good portion of his letter attacking the careless and corrupt tongue. And again, over Thanksgiving and now that Christmas is coming, perhaps some of you may not get along as well with some of your family that you come in contact with and you need to be able to practice this thing that, that James is talking about and warning us about with the tongue. And chances are great that every one of us in this room and those out in the cars have some sort of tongue problem. What are some common tongue problems? See if any of these describe you. Complain. Brag. Whine. Lying. Gossiping. Criticizing. Talking crudely. Talking flippantly. Talking condescendingly. Talking too much, talking abrasively. And so it's very likely that everyone here is guilty of at least one of those. And not just by age 
through. Younger people have a problem with this too at school and so forth. And so today we're going to examine the tongue and see that the tongue is powerful and it needs to be controlled. We're going to see that the tongue is perverse and it needs to be correct. And we'll discover that the tongue is polluted and it needs to be cleansed. So first, verses 3 through 5, again in James chapter 3, you can follow along. Again, we're not going to read all of this, but you can see in verses 3 through 5, he starts to talk about horses and ships. And, and so that's kind of what we're going to look at first. Notice in verses 3 through 5 that James tells us that the tongue is powerful. And he makes some comparisons. He begins, he says, behold or look at the horse. And the tongue is compared to the bridle. Bridles are harnesses that go to the horse's head and hold the bits in the horse's mouth and connect it to the bit or the reins. And so if a person can control the bit, then the person can control the horse. And it's amazing that a 1,200-pound animal can be turned by a 4-inch piece of metal. And this little 20-ounce slab of muscle in our mouths can sure get these 100, 200 pound, whatever you are, bodies in a lot of trouble. And this little part called the tongue is powerful and influential and it needs to be controlled. And it's no wonder that God has placed two watchmen over that tongue. Not only those teeth, but also those lips to, to sort of watch and, and cover. Psalm 141 verse 3 says, Say watch or guard, O Lord, before my mouth. Keep the door of my lips. Oh, how we like the psalmist need to declare, Say to God over my mouth before I complain about my income. Set a guard, O oh Lord, over my mouth before I criticize someone else's walk with you. Set a Lord, set a guard, O oh Lord, on my mouth before I repeat gossip. Set a guard, O oh Lord, on my mouth before I whine about life. Set a guard, O oh Lord, on my mouth before I talk down to my spouse. Might all of us cry out this morning. Might it be our, our prayer today. Say, watch, O oh Lord, a guard before my mouth. Keep the door of my lips. I wonder this morning, even over the Thanksgiving holiday, how many of you spent a good bit of your time complaining? James then tells us in verse 4, Behold also, or look also at the ships, he says. And he compared with the ship, the hammer rudder is very small. For example, I read that the Queen Elizabeth weighed 83,673 gross tons, while the rudder of the ship weighed 140 tons. Yet when the rudder is turned, it controls the direction of the ship. You see, man can control such a large vessel with a small device. Therefore, we must not misjudge the power of the tongue based on its small size. A horse needs a ride to hold the reins. A ship needs a pilot at the rudder. Your tongue needs a master to control it. Your tongue needs a master to control it. And a third assembly of the tongue is a fire. And we've seen before, especially in places like California, and I think Aiken had some fires not too long ago. A lighted match that is carelessly thrown may start a brush fire, which in turn may ignite a forest and leave a charred mess of ruins. And James has told us, and he has warned us, that the tongue may be small, but it is powerful and it needs to be controlled. On a hill in an English country churchyard stands a tombstone which reads this. Beneath this stone, a lump of clay, lies Arabella Young, who on the 24th of May began to hold her tongue. It took death before Arabella Young's tongue was under control. I wonder about your tongue this morning. Have you asked 
accidentally burn someone with your tongue? Did you unintentionally or maybe even intentionally hurt someone as an arsonist would and burn? Is your tongue unpredictable and out of control, striking like lightning and damaging whomever you hit? Small and influential, but yet that tongue is powerful. And it must be controlled. So first, the tongue is powerful. But look at verses 6 through 8. Now we see that the tongue is perverse. The tongue is perverse. The tongue is a fire, James says. A world of iniquity. And James tells us that the tongue is ignited by the very fires of hell. And when we hear statements like, I hate you. Or, or I want a divorce. Or I never loved you. And even someone will tell somebody, go to hell. Quite often the fifth of our evil hearts collects right on the tip of that tongue. Just ready to spill out. And that's what happens. A woman went to a preacher and she knew what her talent was. And she said, I think my talent from God is to speak my mind. And the preacher replied, well, I don't think God would mind if you chose to bury that particular talent. So, speaking forth everything that comes to mind is unwise and poisonous speech. Ephesians 4, 29 says, Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. The Bible says our words should encourage and build up people, not tear down. How often, husband, do you criticize your wife? How often, parents, do you downgrade your children? How often do you belittle family and friends? Who knows the harm done, the tears that have flowed, the broken hearts, the severed relationships because of our critical, unnecessary, and forked tongues set on fire by hell itself. Have your comments at home, work, church even, been uplifted, meant to help encourage others? Or have they been words to degrade, words to destroy others? My, your communication and my communication be that which is good to edify others. Another perverse use of the tongue is gossip or talebearing, as the King James Version uses. How we need to be aware when someone comes up to you and begins to sense, have you heard? Or say something like, uh, don't tell anybody, but this is what I heard. And of course, when you begin with don't tell anybody, what's that person going to do? Is something juicy enough that you're going to want to go and tell? I'm sure I heard so and so and this and that. But how big of a problem that gossip is. You know, a lot of Christians may not go out and rob a bank or do something like that. But a lot of Christians will get on the phone, call up and talk, just create all kinds of gossip and text it or however that it might be spread. In Proverbs 18, 8 says, the words of a talebearer or gossip are as wounds, and they go down into the innermost parts of the bed. You know, you may not take a knife and stab somebody, but physically, but a lot of pain has been created by gossip. Amen, it has. Probably in some of our own families, there are some, 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 some relationships that aren't what they should be. Maybe some friendships that aren't what they should be because of the tongue. And because of things that have been said, some hurtful words, maybe 20 years ago, and you still haven't spoken to that person. You remember the words of a talebearer are as wounds before you repeat that venomous nugget, lest it destroy a man. You remember the words of a talebearer are as wounds before you tell that poisonous tidbit, lest you 
can't split a church. Remember the words of a talebearer on his wounds before you talk about another family's struggles. Before you spread office gossip, church gossip, workplace, school, whatever it is. Remember the words of a talebearer on his wounds and they go down into the innermost parts of the bed. Picture it in your mind. And I know the sounds whatever, but this is really the way it is for a lot of people when it comes to gossip. You've got a gossiper feeding a listener all these delicious tidbits and the listener just enjoys that guy licking their lips like a dog would watching you eat your turkey and dressing this past week. And that's kind of the way it is for a listener. Listening to gossip. Tell me more, they say, licking their lips. I like that. The tongue is perverse, needing to be corrupt. It's no wonder that Proverbs 26, 20 says, where there is no wood, the fire goes out. Where there is no wood, the fire goes out. Sometimes we just need to learn to keep our mouth shut when there's things going on and not repeat stuff and the fire will go out on its own. But sometimes when something's going around, say it's a false rumor, even about you. Sometimes we try to go around and correct it with so many people that people begin to believe it's true. And sometimes if you'll just leave the thing alone, the fire will go out and you'll be telling people stuff that didn't even ever hear about it until you told them. So that's why the Bible says where there is no wood, the fire goes out. Don't put wood on the fire. Leave it alone. It'll burn out on its own. One little word. And perverse talk spreads like an infection. How serious does God take this sin? Listen to Luke chapter 12, verses 2 and 3. For there is nothing covered that shall not be revealed, neither hid that shall not be known. Therefore, whatsoever you have spoken in darkness, shall be heard in the light. And that which you have spoken in the ear in closets shall be proclaimed upon the housetops. You know, we're quick to point our finger out at all kinds of sins, but Jesus says that which you have spoken in the ear in closets shall be proclaimed. What you thought was said or done in the privacy of your own home, be careful, those on telephones and so forth, because Matthew chapter 12 tells us that every idle word you'll be judged for. We don't understand all that's involved there, but if we are told that every idle word you'll be judged for. Someone has said, Give not thy tongue too great liberty, lest it take thee prisoner. Perhaps your tongue problem is not being critical or gossiping, but entirely something else. Maybe you have a problem with foul language. You know, you can hardly pull up at a gas station anymore without hearing all kinds of music blaring, hearing people talking all sorts of language that you wouldn't want to hear. Profanity. The Bible says he will not hold him guiltless who taketh his name in vain. You know, if taking the name of the Lord in vain is part of your everyday speech, then you have a tongue problem that you need to deal with. Away with the slander, the gossip, the deceit, the half-truths, the sarcastic put-downs, the profanity and other sins of the tongue. They defile and they destroy others. Lord said, a watch upon my lips, my tongue control the day. Help me evaluate each thought and guard each word, I say. Proverbs 8, 8 says, all the words of my mouth are in righteousness. There's nothing forward or perverse in them. You know, James tells us in verse 7, he says, all kinds of beasts have been tamed. At a circus, you know, you'll see lions and tigers and bears and elephants and sea, sea world. You see those sea creatures all tamed by man. Man has done an incredible job of taming animals except for one beast, the tongue. The tongue. He says, the tongue no man can take. Notice James does not say the tongue is untamable. 
untamable. He says no man can tame. It's humanly untamable. Only God can do that. Now quickly, I'm almost through. Verses 9 through 12. So far we've seen the tongue is powerful. It needs to be controlled. The tongue is perverted. It needs to be corralled. And now verses 9 through 12, we'll discover the tongue is polluted. It needs to be cleansed. If you were to take a half a cup of milk, and you were to mix it with a half a cup of sour milk, what would it taste like? Probably not good if you don't like drinking sour milk. Now what if we mix a half of what we say, praise, worship, blessings, encouragement, and then mix it the other half with mean-spirited words and mix them all up, how do you think that that tastes to God? Not good. One minute a, a man blesses God with the tongue and next he curses Him and those who are made in God's image. James says this should not be so. In verse 11 he says, A fountain does not send forth sweet and bitter water. The tongue should not do, do that either. I wonder, as a fountain, is your tongue producing puddles of put-downs or pools of praise? James then tells us in verse 12, In nature, a tree only produces one kind of fruit. A fig tree produces fruit. A, a fig, a peach tree produces peaches. A pear tree, if you've got a pear tree planted in your yard, you expect there to be pears. Well, then why do our tongues produce two different kinds of fruit? Good and evil. Praying to the Father on Sunday, and then cussing at a co-worker on Monday. Shouldn't be so. Shouldn't be so. You know, there's a threefold test that people have come up with that we should ask before we repeat something. Is it true? Is it kind? Is it necessary? As the fountain sends out one kind of water, the tree one kind of fruit, so should we consistently have pure Speech. I wonder this morning, is your tongue polluted? Does it need to be cleansed? Let Christ do it. In conclusion, now we've examined the tongue. So much can be done for good with the tongue, but we so often misuse our tongues. Who can estimate all the evil caused by the tongue? Scandals, slander, lies, Strive, alienations from family, and so forth. What's your tongue problem today? Think about this for just a moment. What is your tongue problem today? Is it complaining, expressing grief and pain and discontent all the time? Is it bragging, talking boastfully about self and all you've accomplished in life? Is it criticizing, finding fault with everyone and everything? Is it talking crude, lacking grace and tact in speech? Is it talking condescendingly, that is, speech sort of with an air of superiority? I'm better than you. Is it talking abrasively, speech that contains or causes irritation? Is it profanity, lying? Our words are like toothpaste, as we've seen in a lot of children's sermons. Once they're out, can't take them back. You see, as a believer in Christ, you must confront these sins in yourself. As I said, most of us in this room probably wouldn't go out of here and rob a bank or kill somebody today. But probably all of us will sin with this tongue in some way or somehow. You say that, you know, that flesh is constantly warred against the Spirit. You know, we've got to come. We don't have new bodies yet. We don't have a new tongue. So what do we take from today's message as we leave here on this last Sunday in November? First, diagnose which tongue disease you have. Which tongue disease you battle with. Secondly, repent of that sin. Third, pray regarding that tongue problem. 
And then find a scripture to assist you with it. Scripture is like Psalm 39 1. I will take heed to my ways that I will not sin with my tongue. Maybe you don't praise God enough. Psalm 51 15. O oh Lord, open thou my lips, my mouth shall show forth thy praise. I had two funerals this week. One, one individual was in his 80s. The other person was only 44. You know, life is short. Too short to hold grudges. If there were some words spoken however long ago and there's some grudges there, you need to, you need to get to talk about it. You need to confront it. You need to deal with it. Whatever it is, life's too short to hold a grudge. And when that person passes off the scene, and you never attempted to reach out and reconcile, are you going to be able to deal with that? Are you going to be able to live with that? So as we prepare for the invitation, only Jesus can help you with your tongue and cross in controlling that tongue. Would you bow in prayer with me, please? Father in heaven, we thank you for these few moments to share your word today. And over the last several weeks, we were on a mission trip with Paul and Silas and Timothy and Luke. And Lord, they used their tongue to glorify you. Whether it was to share the gospel and then you the women there at the river. Whether it was to speak to the deep to come out of the girl who was possessed. Lord, whether it was to sing praises to you at midnight there in the jail. Lord, we see several examples where Paul and Silas, those missionaries, used their tongues to bring glory to your name. Lord, I wonder about us this morning. I wonder if there's some relationships that are torn. I wonder if there's some things that we need to make right. Lord, if we're going to do that, it's going to require the tongue. And Lord, perhaps there's someone here who doesn't know Jesus as their personal Lord and Savior. We know that. Your word tells us, if thou shalt confess with thy mouth that tongue, the Lord Jesus, and believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. The tongue is a little member, but it's very powerful. And Lord, might we be careful how we use you in these days. Bless this time of invitation, we pray, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.